www.meetradio.com. Hello again, everybody. This is Joe Larson, and you're watching the Five Off, Five On Racing Show. Tonight's show, we're going to have some fun tonight. we got a lot to talk about. Of course, we're going to start off with our Where Are They Now segment with NASCAR Wheel and Modified Multi-Champion Tony Hirschman Jr. and NASCAR Monster Energy Cup Series two-time champion Joe Weatherly. We'll also uh, give our thoughts out to Dan Gurney and his family on the loss of Dan Gurney and I'm very sorry for her. but we're also going to talk about the Sprint Car Hall of Fame and their inductees for 2018 as well as the NASCAR Hall of Fame which held its inductee ceremony this past weekend at a Charlotte North Carolina we also have the Eastern Motorsports Press Association's Hall of Fame announcement of drag race star Shirley Muldowney we have some news coming out of NASCAR, some of the things that are going on in NASCAR, and also some of the, if not all of the changes in the 2018 Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series driver changes, and there were more than I thought about, and even more crew chief changes, which there's no way we could talk about in a one-hour show. We talk about the sad news coming out of Englishtown, New Jersey. We'll talk about what's coming up in the Atlantic City Indoor Racing Series. And we talk about two more tracks that happen to be in New York that are stepping away from the NASCAR sanctioning. And then we're going to talk about some of the ongoings in NASCAR. But coming right up, the Where Are They Now segment. We have... Alrighty, five-time NASCAR Wheel and Modified Champion Tony Hirschman Jr. at a Northampton, Pennsylvania. He uh, in two years and seven events in the X Series, Xfinity Series. I'm sorry. He was also a driver in the Canaan and Pro Series East with one win in 47 starts there, spanning four seasons in the Canaan and Pro Series East. Uh, and Rookie of the Year in 1992. He was with the Mod Tour from his exception, its exception in 1985, ending his modified driving career in 2007. He had 35 victories and five championships in 95, 96, 99, 2004, and 2005. He won the coveted Sunoco Modified Racer Champions four times. Tony was named one of NASCAR's modified top 50 drivers. Hirschman had 41 poles on his modified tour stint, and only Mike Stefanik had more Whalen modified poles than Tony Hirschman. In 2003, Hirschman was named as one of NASCAR's all time top drivers. In 1977 and 78, while driving at Mahonan Valley Speedway, he won the championship, and again, at, I'm sorry, at the Mahoning Valley Speedway, and then two more championships in A78 and 80 at the Mountain Speedway in Pennsylvania. Tony Hirschman Jr. is married with two sons, Tony Hirschman III, who is a spotter on the Monster Energy Cup, NASCAR Cup Series, and Matt Hirschman, a modified star in many of the modified series throughout the Northeast, Central United States, and down in the South. My dealings with Tony Hoshman Jr. while I was a tour official and race director, I found Tony to be very quiet. He walked around, didn't say much. He strapped into his car and he took care of business on the racetrack. One of the cleanest drivers that I have witnessed, and I've witnessed many, and when I say cleanest driver, when he passed you, he passed you clean. 
was a little rough. Yeah, you get into some of these short tracks in the NASCAR wheel and modified to it. There's a lot of bumping and grinding. But Tony, I, I don't remember a lot of times that Tony Hirschman's car came off the hook. And, and that's a lot to be said. And my involvement with Tony Hirschman Jr. was during his time primarily with the Kahili's, uh, Bob and Tom Kahili, who were also gentlemen in our sport, that uh, they always made a point at the end of the season to take some of the officials out to a nice dinner and talk. And, and that says a lot because there's, there's this fine line between official and race teams where you're trying to get one over on one another if, in so many words, where the teams are trying to push the envelope, the officials are trying to close that envelope. And this team never did any of that. Inspecting their car was, was like, like it came out of the R&D center in NASCAR, like it was a house car. So Attorney Hirschman is uh, still involved in the sport. He, he, he repairs and, and clips a lot of the modifieds that, that get wrecked. And many a night you see a guy wrecked with his modified and, he, and you hear him say to his crew, he goes, I guess we're going to Hirschman. So Tony Hirschman, five-time NASCAR wheel and modified champ, uh, still turning wrenches, still watching his boys perform, one up in the spotter stand and the other uh, driving a modified, following his dad's footsteps. Our next person in the Where Are They Now is a two-time Monster Energy Cup Series driver, Joe Weatherly. Joe Weatherly was born May 29th, 1922 in Norfolk, Virginia. He passed away January 19th, 1964. He was nicknamed the crown prince of racing due to his outrageous behavior. Weatherly raced at a time before fire suits, once wearing a Peter Pan suit during practice. He would often party all night long and go right to the racetrack and go racing. Prior to his NASCAR career, Weatherly won three AMA, American Motorcycle Association, national championships between 1946 and 1950. In 1998, Weatherly was inducted into the American Motorcycle Association Hall of Fame. Weatherly began racing cars, though, in 1950, winning the first modified event he entered. He won 49 of the 83 car races he entered in 1950. He was the NASCAR modified national champion in 1952, again winning 49 of the 83 races he entered. In 1953, he was the modified national champion again, this time winning an astounding 52 races in the modified series. In 55 and 56, he was a part owner of what is now known as Richmond International Raceway. After selling his shares of Richmond, Weatherly entered the Grand National Series, driving a factory-sponsored Ford for Pete DiPaolo Engineering. For the next two seasons, he drove for the Holman Moody Group. Voted most popular driver in NASCAR Grand National Series in 1961. Weatherly won two consecutive championships in 62 and 63, driving for Bud Moore. Bud Moore passed away late last year. We talked about him back in November, I believe. Uh, Moore did not have, at the time, the resources to compete full time. So Weatherly often hitched rides with many other teams in the events that Bud Moore did not field a car. Weatherly died in 1964 from injuries sustained in a racing accident at the fifth race of 1964 at the Riverside International Raceway in California. Weatherly's head went outside of the car and struck a retaining wall, killing him instantly. He was not wearing a shoulder harness and refused to use a window net for fear of being trapped and not being able to get out of his race car in the event of a fire. Weatherly was one of two drivers in cup history to die as they were defending their championship. Alan Kowicki was the second after his 1992 champion. 
It took NASCAR over seven years to mandate the use of window nets. Richard Petty's crash at Darlington in 1970 was the last one where his arm went flopping out of the window. NASCAR then mandated window nets ever since. Joe Weatherly was named one of NASCAR's 50 greatest drivers in 1998, inducted into the Motorsports Hall of Fame of America in 2009, inducted into NASCAR Hall of Fame Class of 2015. Weatherly had 25 wins in the NASCAR Energy Cup Series, 12 wins in the NASCAR Convertible Series. Joe Weatherly, one of the pioneers of our sport, coming along at a time where Drivers were men, and some of them got killed. And NASCAR, based on injuries that some guys like Joe Weatherly had and Earnhardt over the years, made and mandated rules to add to the safety of race cars. Joe Weatherly, good man. I didn't get to see him race. I was too young. But I'll tell you what, I've watched videos. The man was amazing, always up front. Yeah, anyway. The next thing we got to talk about, and it seems like every week we're talking about somebody else, that legends in our sport, that the time has come. Legendary driver Dan Gurney died last Sunday at the age of 86 of complications from pneumonia. Gurney, a seven-time winner in the IndyCar Series, five-time in NASCAR's Top Series, and four times in Formula One. Gurney won the 1967 24 Hours of Le Mans, teaming up with A.J. Foyt, and now the, and now the inaugural Rolex 24 at Daytona in 1962. His racing career showed 51 victories, 47 podium finishes, and only 312 starts. Gurney, a Long Island native who was born in Port Jefferson, New York, was credited with creating the Wickerbill, an aerodynamic device still used in racing today and also in the aviation industry. He was the first driver to wear a full-faced helmet and the first driver to spray champagne in Victory Lane, whereas up to his time, most drivers drank it. Dan Gurney, our prayers go out to you, your family, Thank you so much for your driving, for putting on a show, and leaving us with great memories in racing. Dan Gurney was 86 years old. Godspeed, Dan Gurney. We're going to take a break. Hey, hey, what's up? Oh, I said, was gonna say, what's up for some reason? Hey, hey we're we set it up, and you're watching the In Radio TV Network. Music Shop of Master, 1-800-HEY-DUDE, your full service store with personalized attention, school band instrument rentals and sales, music instruction on all instruments for all styles and age groups, for guitars, drums, amplifiers, PA systems and accessories, it's Village Music Shop, 1495 Montauk Highway in Master. call 1-800-HEY-DUDE or go to villagemusicshop.com. Hi there, this is Buddy from Less Than Jake, and you are listening to In Radio TV. You're probably watching it too.
Welcome back. Welcome back. All right, the NASCAR Hall of Fame down in Concord, or Charlotte, I should say, North Carolina, had its annual induction this past weekend, inducting five legends of NASCAR sport. And we had two drivers, a crew chief, an engine builder. And these are the guys. Robert Yates. We'll start with Red Byron first. Red Byron, we, we talked about him in the Where Are We Now. He was NASCAR's first, he won NASCAR's first sanctioned race, and he was NASCAR's first champion. Then we got Ken Squire. He co-founded the Motor Racing Network back in 1970, and he broadcasted for NASCAR's first flag-to-flag -flag coverage of the Daytona 500 live on CBS in 1979. We have Ron Hornaday, a competitor in NASCAR's Camping World Truck Series since its inception in 1995, with 51 victories and four championships. Ray Everham, three-time champion crew chief for Jeff Gordon, who teamed up to win 47 cup races. Ray Everham also went on to form Everham Motorsports. And now back to uh, just doing other things in NASCAR to keep it better. Now, Robert Yates. Robert Yates, who passed away this past October 2nd from cancer. He was a 1999 Cup champion owner with Dale Earnhardt. I'm sorry, Dale Jarrett driving for him. And he was also the engine builder for most Ford-powered Cup cars and Xfinity cars. And you'll see his engines in trucks, modifieds, K&A, Pro Series cars, and just about, I'll tell you what, some weekly guys I've seen with Robert Yates engines. The class of 2018, a brilliant and class of, of drivers. One from years ago, one in our lifetime, Ray Everham, one of the best crew chiefs that I've ever seen work. And, and Ray Everham's one of his things was he needed to gel, and him and Jeff Gordon gelled at a first practice session down in uh, Charlotte Motor Speedway. And then, of course, we got Ron Hornaday, the old guy who the truck series was just meant to be. It was his type of thing. And getting into the Hall of Fame, a lot of people, and, and I see this in social media, a lot of people are like, so-and-so should be in the Hall of Fame, and this one should be in the Hall of Fame. Why isn't that one in the Hall of Fame? And there is criteria. And, and I know it seems like modified guys and gals are kind of left out of this. There's a couple of modified guys that, that should be, and I'm not going to you know, sit there and, and, and push for them you know, in this venue. But you know, it seems like the modified people are left out. And what's happening is a lot of the people who were doing the voting probably never saw a modified race. They never saw a Mike Stefanik run. They never saw a Tony Hirschman Jr. run, or when his time comes, a, a Donnie Leah or a Doug Kobe. Even with today's racing being broadcast all over the world, the modifieds don't get that recognition. And you know, it's something that needs to be worked on moving forward. Back in the day, there wasn't a lot of TV coverage. And in fact, it was until 1979, there was no live TV coverage of auto racing. It was always a clip of the race. It would be a start, maybe some of the crashes, and the end. But there wasn't real racing. And when I say real racing, real racing coverage until even into the 80s. And TV brought a lot of money into racing. And it, it raised salaries. It raised purses. It put the price of tickets to some people out of reach. But when you think of the Hall of Fame, you know, I always say, you know, guys like, like Jerry Cook, why is he not there? And, and I see stuff like that, and I see some of the names, you know, that in Modifieds that they could have raced right with these guys under different circumstances, the Charlie Gizombachs, you know, when you'd look back and it was, and, and I only know Long Island modified guys or tour modified guys. I don't know of the modified drivers that race through all the tracks in Connecticut and Massachusetts and New Hampshire and New Jersey, even the ones that race down south in, in North and South Carolina. I, I, I didn't know any of those people. And, and that's the problem with the voting because 
There's a voting group. There's a group of people that vote. And yeah, you and I could put in our votes as well, but the people who make the decisions are NASCAR people, people that are on the, the racing commissions, people who own racetracks. And there's a lot of politics involved with that, like with any other Hall of Fame induction. And you know, you, you look at the Baseball Hall of Fame and a lot of the baseball writers of America who, who induct baseball players into the Hall of Fame don't want to induct those guys that, that took steroids and enhanced their abilities. And I don't know if that's right or wrong, the, that player still had to get up to the plate and, and bat the ball, or that pitcher had to still get on the mound and throw strikes. And no matter how big and how strong you are, you, you still have to know the mechanics. But in racing, it's the same thing. And when you look at these things, you look at some of the drivers you know, that are not in the Hall of Fame, <laughs> And some of the criteria that is set forth to get into the Hall of Fame, you know, you sit back and wonder, is certain people, will they ever get in? So the NASCAR Hall of Fame, I, I've been there many, many, many times. I look forward to going again the next time I'm in that area. And I'll tell you what, if, you know, I've, I've heard good and bad about it, but I've been there so many times. And you, you can't just rush through it. You've got to give yourself a half a day and, and to go through it. Go have an early lunch. Spend your time there. When you walk out, go get dinner. Um, give, it, give it the time that, that, that it deserves. There's a lot of displays, a lot of history in there. Read the plaques, read the signs. Uh, participate in so many interactive um, things that they have there as well. But uh, NASCAR Hall of Fame, class of 18, Red Byron, Ken Squire, Ron Hornaday, Ray Everham, and Robert Yates. Uh, good class of people. Another Hall of Fame that got inductions this past, uh, this past week was the Sprint Car Hall of Fame located in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, eight legends of the sport uh, of sprint car racing were announced as the 29th class of inductees and they were put into the National Sprint Car Hall of Fame. And uh, driver Brian Clawson, who, who died uh, in 2016 from injuries, was in, in the uh, Hall of Fame. David Steele, Steel, who died last year in his um, quest for stardom in the series. And driver Dan Lance DeWeese was also inducted. Mechanic Scott Gherkin, who was one of the best mechanics that this series has ever had. Emmett J. Malloy, engine builder. He was the Robert Yates of sprint cars. Owner Steve Bittler. Steve Bittler owned some championship cars over the years. And, and when I saw these last two names, I was like happy. Because um, sometimes the media people get forgotten. Uh, Bob Mays, media guy, writer. Oscar, Oscar Dwayne Garnon was also a media person. And I'll tell you what, years and years ago, if it wasn't for the media, most people wouldn't know a thing about racing. Wouldn't know, unless you knew somebody, unless you went to the tracks. But back in those days, there were not just racing papers like we have today, there were local racing papers, but the newspaper, the local sports page in that local newspaper had, had like a whole page of auto racing, especially for the local stuff. And you'd see headlines, you know, so-and-so, you know, is ousted by so-and-so. And if you ever watched that movie, The Big Wheel, starring Mickey Rooney, you know, in between the race footage, they'd show the newspaper spinning around and boom, there's and on its side and, and they put the kid wins again or stuff like that. That was real. That was real. See, today to get racing news, you need to go online. There's many avenues to go online to get racing news. And there's also the local racing newspapers. One that comes to mind is the area auto racing news. And, and I'll tell you what, I get a lot of my racing news from that because, you know, there's just so much you can read on the Internet and how much of it is real and how much of it is made up. But when, when you look at that and read that, it, they cover everything from, from go-karts right up to the top top levels 
and they have reporters all over the world and all over the country covering every series and dirt and asphalt and drag racing. And uh, it's, really, it's really a good thing when you, when you see that. But media guys in these Hall of Fames, and, and I don't believe, and, I, and I, in fact, I know there is not a media person now except for like an announcer or a commentator but there's no newspaper people from the media in ask Hall of Fame and that that should be something that needs to be worked on in the future because many of the writers and and many of the now today bloggers and internet people who have websites there's some of those people that have been with this sport their whole life and and I think they deserve their right they deserve their right in the Hall of Fame and speaking of Hall of Fame Drag racing star, Shirley Muldowney. Shirley, Cha-Cha Muldowney, as she was named, was uh, put into the, inducted into the Eastern Motorsports Press Association's Hall of Fame. Muldowney, who now makes her home in Huntersville, North Carolina, was unable to attend the ceremony. However, she was thankful to be inducted as she spoke to everybody through a phone interview. Modani was a street racer in upstate New York in the late 50s, started professionally racing drag cars at Fonda, New York's 1 8 mile drag strip, racing there until 1968. And Fonda eventually became a quarter mile drag strip where she continued to win races. And in 1965, Modani became the first woman ever to be licensed by the NHRA. Uh, Muldowney was one of those people that sh they told her she couldn't do it and she went out and did it. And her looks, the way she presented herself, it was easy for her to find sponsors, but in the, it was not easy to participate in the man's world in drag racing. And many times a lot of scuffles with her husband and boyfriends at the time and other competitors and a lot of stuff going on that if you ever watch that movie Heart Like a Wheel starring Bonnie Bedelia, it's, it's about her life. And you know, a lot of people only see the, the glory behind all this race and stuff. They only see the fame. They don't see the hard work and, and sacrifice that it takes to become a racer at any level. You know, nobody just walks in and becomes an NHRA champion. Nobody just walks in with their fire suit and helmet and gets in a stock car and becomes the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series champion. You don't start there. You start in the trenches. You start in your backyard. You just go to your garage. You go to your friend who has a bigger garage. Then you get a shop. You bang it on doors every day possible trying to get a sponsor for the next race and when you get one that like, does I'll do three races you're you're ecstatic Shirley McDowney was everything in her race team she just wasn't a pretty face that hopped in some race car and went racing she built them she wrecked them she fixed them she went back out and won and there weren't too many women back in the 50s and 60s and even 70s that could say that there's a couple now, and they're going to be in a focus on where are they now segment later on in the season. But Shirley McDowney, congratulations on your induction into the Eastern Motorsports Press Association Hall of Fame. An honor at any level, and I've said it before, any time that your name is associated with a Hall of Fame, it's a proud moment. We're going to take a break. We come back. We're going to talk about some NASCAR news and what stuff's going on for 2018 when we come back. Hi, I'm Remington. I'm Emerson. And I'm Sebastian. We're Palais Royale, and you're watching in Radio TV. The world of advertising has changed. Radio, TV, and newspaper revenues have declined drastically. Why? Because businesses have realized that advertising return on investment isn't what it used to be. So what can we do about it? Well, that's easy. Advertise online. Own a local restaurant, real estate agency, or even a national retail chain? Whatever your business, in Radio can get your message out there. And we can do it at a fraction of the cost. Call today and see the difference for yourself. This isn't TV. This isn't radio. This is in Radio.com. Hey, this is Chris Lush Dick, and if InRavio.com spots you at an event wearing this bracelet, they will give you $100. 
Village Music Shop of Master. 1-800-HEY-DUDE, your full service store with personalized attention, school band instrument rentals and sales, music instruction on all instruments for all styles and age groups, for guitars, drums, amplifiers, PA systems and accessories. It's Village Music Shop, 1495 Montauk Highway in Mastic. Call 1-800-HEY-DUDE or go to villagemusicshop.com. Hi, this is Mike Jarecki from My Race News, and you're watching the Enravio TV Network. Hey, welcome back. NASCAR News 2018. Anybody headed for Speed Weeks for the Daytona 500 definitely needs to get a scorecard. A lot of changes. A lot of changes for 2018, a lot of driver changes, and a heck of a lot more crew chief changes. Like I said earlier, we don't have time to talk about all of that stuff. But anyway, looking at 2018 in the Monster Energy NASCAR Cup Series, Eric Almarola will be driving for Stuart Haas with his sponsor, Smithfield, after leaving Richard Petty Motorsports. A lot go to be said with this Smithfield deal and... Richard Petty Motorsports really felt they had a handshake agreement for 2018. They're still working on something. But Eric Amarota, uh looking for a, a, a fresh start, so to speak, uh, at Stuart Haas. Eric Amarola, for those who don't remember, who broke his back midseason and uh, came back after rehab, after the doctors cleared him. We'll see what happens with Amarola and Stuart's hot racing. Ryan Blaney. Left the Wood Brothers, going to Penske. <laughs> I don't know. I'm an old school, and, and not that I don't like Penske, but the Wood Brothers have a good product. The Wood Brothers look like they're on track to be competitors again. Penske is a competitor. Penske is a winner. He's a proven winter winner. But Ryan Blaney, just a young guy, and he's changed his image going to Penske. I, I believe he cut his hair and he got rid of his mustache. He looks so different. Maybe he got to go and have a meeting with Roger Penske and says, dude, <laughs> this, this has to go. Just like when Dale Jarrett came to UPS with Robert Yates. UPS had rules, clean shaven. He hopped into that 88 UPS Ford that opening day, then Speed Weeks at Daytona, the mustache was gone. His hair was cut short. I don't know. Alex Bowman will be driving 88 at Hendrick Motorsports. William Byron moves from JR Motorsports Xfinity number no. 9 car to Hendrick Motorsports is number 24. Landon Castle leaves Front Row Motorsports to who knows where. Still seeking a ride for 2018. There's plenty of time. you got like two weeks. Uh, Jeffrey Earnhardt leaves the Monster Sports Group, and he's seeking a ride in 2018. Now, I'm, I'm thinking your family owns a race team. <laughs> um, I'm sure they'll find something. Something. Uh, we'll see. Dale Jr. retired after the 27-16, uh, finishing up at Hendrick Motorsports. He will be in the broadcast booth for NBC Sports NASCAR coverage. So that's good for Dale Jr. Chase Elliott, he's changing numbers at Hendrick from the legendary 24 driven by Jeff Gordon to the, his dad's number, Bill Elliott's number nine. And I'll tell you what, no matter what car you get in at Hendrick Motorsports, you're going to run up front. Eric Jones leaves Furniture Row racing to take over. Joe Gibbs' racing number 20. Casey Kane leaves Hendrick Motorsports for the 95 of the Levine family of racing. That should be interesting. Matt Kenseth leaves Joe Gibbs number 20 to just take a break from racing. Now, <laughs> nobody just takes a break from racing. I mean, I, I was a racer. Not a very good one. But I was a good, you know, I had fun. I had fun racing. And if the right opportunity arose, even 
It'll be 60 at the time, start of the season. I'd still go hop in some car and go play. It's all about having a good time. So uh, I, I think part of the thing with Matt Kenseth is he is at an age where most of the team owners don't want a driver that old. They want these hungry kids. In fact, Matt Kenseth could probably be the father to half the kids, age-wise anyway, to half the kids in the Cup Series. Michael McDonald, he leaves the 95 Lillian car to the 34 Front Row Motorsports. We got Paul Menard, leaves Richard Childress racing for the 21 at Wood Brothers. Darryl Wallace Jr., he was a fill-in driver for several rides in 2017, primarily filling in for Eric Almarola after his back injury. He moves to Richard Petty Motorsports in the famed 43 in 2018. And just announced before we went live today, Danica Patrick. She lost her ride in the 10 at Stuart Haas Racing. And it was announced, and according to ESPN.com, secured a ride for the Daytona 500. She will drive for Premium Motorsports with Tony Uri Jr., a former Xfinity crew chief for her. And uh, they'll be in car number seven. And they'll use that team's charter, the number 15, last year, giving Patrick a guaranteed starting spot in the great American race. Should be interesting. She just has to secure an Indy ride now, and then her bucket list will be filled, I think. But uh, that's, that's 20, though. Here we go. We got how many drivers are changing? I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Almost half. <coughs> Excuse me. Almost half the drivers are new teams switching around, getting around, doing different things. You didn't see that in the 50s and the 60s, even the 70s. There's no more loyalty. It's all about money. And when I say loyalty, you know, think about the Wood Brothers and, and their pure related sponsorship for all those years. Richard Petty and STP, even in the years where maybe he shouldn't have been driving, they stuck by him. You know, Goodwrench was with uh, Dale Earnhardt Sr. for all those years. You look at those things, DuPont with Jeff Gordon, Lowe's with, with uh, yeah, why am I forgetting his name? Jimmy Johnson, sorry about that. A little brain fade there. But when you look at those things, it's, it's a whole different era now. They have teams that are grooming drivers at 14 or 15 years old, getting them into the k and Pro Series each, moving them into truck, Xfinity. Even some of these kids coming out of ARCA, it's just one of those things that it's not the same. It's not the same. <coughs> Excuse me. But when you look at these changes, it's good for the sport. It's definitely good for the sport because you don't get that complacency. You don't get people who just sit there and just go riding around. You know, he, he said, you know, like, like Jay Slice is saying, you're watching a, a Richard Petty interview, and Richard Petty said it's no longer racing today. It's a show with a race thrown into it. And, and I'll tell you what, I, I, I agree with that. And, and I was told that by the hierarchy of, of NASCAR while working a tower for an event. And it was like, all we do is put on a show. And, and, and we're in the entertainment business. And I didn't understand that then. And I, I kind of understand it now. But you know, when, when you look at what comes in, these young guys, and, and somebody had thrown in the slide, Chai's room, the chat room was saying that, you know, now it's not your talent. They don't, team owners don't have a guy get on a plane, go up to Long Island, go to Riverhead Raceway, or go to Connecticut, go to Stafford Motor Speedway, go to you know, Pennsylvania and, and go to Mountain and, and Speedway or Evergreen, whatever it's being called. Nobody's saying go to Wall Speedway down in New Jersey. Not doing it anymore. They're not going out looking for talent. They're developing their own talent. And, and it's based on, think about this, you're a team owner. 
Okay. All right. Team owner, here I am. And I have a choice to put Joe Blow in my car, who's won everything he's driven, championships in multiple divisions at multiple racetracks, Torrance stories wins, Joe Blow. Then I go to Pete Nobody. But Pete Nobody's coming with like $5 million, $10 million, maybe a motor deal, maybe even a sponsor. He's not that good. We'll teach him. He could be taught. He could be trained. But as a team owner, do I go for the million up front? Or do I go with this kid who is one in everything he's driven? And what do we do? What do you do? Hmm. You got to go where the money is. Because that's maybe five million less I got to take out of my pocket. And that's what's happening now. You know? And, and like somebody's, you know, saying that some of these Joe Blows, you look at some of these kids today and they, they don't know how to talk to people. Or you see these young kids today, they talk like, they like President of the United States given their inauguration address <clears throat> because they've been schooled. It's all about presentation. It's all about appearance. And I've said that for a long time. Put on a good appearance and make your sponsors happy. Speak well. They're going to be chasing after you with a microphone. You have your fire suit on. Acme Corporation. For that three-minute interview, Acme Corporation is all over the globe on TV and the Internet. And they tell me once it's on the Internet, it's there forever. It's there forever. Think about that. You know, I, I, I see a lot of these guys at the local racetracks. They take their fire suit off. They tie it around their waist with their sleeves and they have a dirty t-shirt. Sometimes it's, their friend gave them a t-shirt that races in a lower division at their weekly track. You know, they're not promoting their sponsors. Yeah, those seats can get hot sometimes. But you know what? The guy who's paying the bills, think about if he stops paying them. You don't have to worry about being hot no more. But you know, I, I look at these things and I, and, and I say, you know, what's, what's going on? What is going on? You know, and it used to be when you walked around the garage area at a cup race or an Xfinity race or a truck race, you knew that driver from his face. And, and why did you know that driver? Because he had a pair of slacks on and he had his nice, whether it was a button down shirt or a collared shirt with the team logo, maybe his name or her name. Today, you don't see that. They're in their jeans, their sneakers, and, and a t-shirt. I mean, it's not a ripped t-shirt or dirt, but they're in their t-shirt that, and they avoid the crowd. They avoid the crowd. You know, so when you see stuff like that, you know, you, you gotta stop and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, as a fan, have a right to know and see these drivers and meet them and have them sign your die cast, have them sign your hat, your shirt, whatever you have, a piece of paper and a notebook, a program. I was never big on autographs when I was chasing drivers. I was more into taking pictures. And then when I go in, and I, I just, imagine that I had to send out the, the negatives or the, the film to be developed and wait till they came back. And I didn't have the luxury of digital. I, you take the picture, oh, I don't like that one, delete, take it, oh no. But I took pictures, and when they, the pictures came back, I wrote on the back who it was, what track, what year. I had boxes and boxes of pictures. But today it's just so different. And, and I hope NASCAR takes a look at that, and I hope NASCAR decides they need to rebrand the sport from the driver up. That's what they need to do. Anyway, we're going to come back. and we come back, we're going to have some sad chat about what's going on in English town. Raceway Park in New Jersey when we come back.
Hey guys, this is Jibs from Ocean's 8 Alaska and you're watching In Radio TV Network. Hey, I'm, I'm Raul Panther. And I'm Commander B. Hawkins. And I'm Mark Willen. We're uh, some of the proto men. If we see you without this bracelet, we're going to punch in the d But if you have this bracelet from inradio.com, you can win 100 bucks. Put one of these on or else. What's up, guys? This is Assuming We Survive, and you're watching in Radio TV Network. Welcome back. Welcome back. Much needed break. Oil up my throat a little bit. I don't know. I, I was feeling better. I missed last week's show because I had the flu. I was feeling better, and all of a sudden I got this. this well, you could hear it, I'm sure. But I feel fine. Anyway, sad news. English Town, Raceway Park, an NHRA race, NHRA shocker. English Town ceases drag racing operations, canceling the NHRA 49th annual Summer Naturals, Nationals, 53 years of drag racing history. Gone. News like this. It's heartbreaking. For stock car fans, it's the equivalent of Daytona International Speedway closing. For baseball fans, it's like saying there'll never no be another game at Yankee Stadium. For tennis fans, Wimbledon does not exist. Do you get it now? Another racing venue, another racing icon to our sport of racing is gone due to corporate greed. Now I'm not going to get into the politics of why and why not because you don't know who to believe. But English Town was one of the most popular and longest running racetracks in the NHRA national event circuit for 50 years and it's going to close immediately. Not one more season, not a farewell race. Cease to operate and close immediately. This place has been around forever. The facility that it's located on, however, will remain open for motocross and other forms of racing as well as concerts, flea markets, and other local events. This is a crusher. This is a crusher. And for those who, who don't know, I, I am kind of involved with Long Island Needs, a drag strip, and now more than ever, more than ever, Long Island Needs, a drag strip. Where are Long Islanders going to race drag cars? Millions and millions of dollars of equipment is sitting in garages and shops throughout Long Island that have now become even more useless. And, and it's, it's something that needs to be addressed. And, and the people who go and fight these things, these drag strips being built and open, these racetracks being built and open, um, are people who want, they want to live in a storybook little world. They want to live in their own storybook little world. It's the old adage, yeah, they can have it, but not in my backyard. And from the homeowners and property owners and politicians, and I say politicians because that's what they are, they tell you at your meeting, you're good to go. And they tell the other people, it'll never happen. And I witnessed that firsthand on many occasions. 
because I went to both meetings. And these people don't realize the money that's brought into their community. Think about, we'll talk about a drag strip. Four or 5,000 people attend for a, a small type of event. Four or 5,000 people attend. They're not from the neighborhood, they're from all over. So they, they, they have to buy food, they have to buy ice, they have to buy drinks, they have to stay somewhere. And, and I'm telling you what, I'm, I've been looking at my travel for 2018, and I never really had to take a look at what it costs to go to a venue. I never really had to take a look at what am I going to have to pay for lodging. It's, it's expensive. It's expensive, and, and unless you book months and months and months out, you might not even find a place to stay for that venue. But, you know... When a place like English Town closes, and again, I'm not going to get into the reasons because I, I only believe half of them and the other half of, were just to go against the first half so it all balances out. But when, when you, you see that, you, you see a venue like this closing and, and you're like, wow, how could that be? And, and the other thing that bothers me, this isn't something that one weekend, the, the people went for a drink, go out to dinner or a cup of coffee. All right, we're going to cease operations here and affect a Monday. Okay, Monday? Monday work for everybody? No, this had to be something that was done up over time. If, they were, if they're getting out because it's not a moneymaker, bring somebody who in capacity can make some money. Let them give it. Give them a year or two. If it's something that just has to be done because of the politics of the area, hey, give us one more year so we could have, have a nice farewell, so we could go out and say, wow, hey, let's, let's give tribute to some of these guys. You know, and when you, when you think about these things, it's, it's sad. And for every racetrack that's closing, you don't see another one being built anywhere. And you could go into any of the real estate, buy and sells, whatever, and you're going to find a racetrack or two or three. Some of them in, are the middle of nowhere. Some of them are right there, boom, right off the main highways. And you got to ask yourself, why did that not make it? And I could tell you why. Because some of the, the weekly track owners, it's not their bread and butter. It's, it's a group of guys, a woman, or a, a mix of everybody who are trying to make a couple of bucks. And they realize, whoa, whoa, good thing I have a day job here. That's why I'm making it. Instead of trying to make it successful, instead of buying a place and bringing in your own people, racing people who know how to make it work. Because at the end of the night, when you count your monies, after you paid your purses, Paid your workers, paid your officials, paid your food and beer bill. Hopefully at the end of the night, there's a little pile left for your own self. And when that stops happening, especially when there's partners involved, everybody wants to bail out and get their cut. Let me go, Bob, you promised me I'd get a million at the end. Oh, I want my million now. First of all, when you're going to buy a racetrack, don't, and I'm going to give you some advice here, don't buy it with a partner. Okay, unless it's your wife or your husband. That's the only partnership I can see working out. Don't buy, because in every business partnership, there's the money and the brains. When the brains pull out, the money disappears. When the money pulls out, the guy with the brains doesn't know what to do because he doesn't have the money. Because he has all these, how did they say it in days of things? I have a lot of dreams I didn't pay for yet. You can't let this happen, folks. We can't continue to let racetracks close, especially of the magnitude of English Town. Who can forget, at least here you know, in the New York metropolitan area and into Pennsylvania and, and Jersey, the commercials that were on the radio back then, even on local TV, you know, with that high pitch, you know, that little laugh thing, and says, Raceway Park, you know. Who can forget that? 
It's gone. It's gone. We take these places for granted. We figure, ah, they'll always be here. We don't have to worry about it. We'll make it happen. We'll, we'll definitely make it happen. But another venue bites the dust. Another one. Another one in it, and it's not, it's not pretty. It's sad. So Long Island needs its drag strip. Let's roll up the sleeves. Let's tighten up the belts. Put your good sneakers on, because you're going to be in for a battle, and you can't lose it. You can't lose this battle. Anyway, some good news. This weekend at the Atlantic City Boardwalk Hall, the 16th running of the Gambler's Classic will be on hand, and we'll have the TQ Midgets, the Champ Carts, and the Slingshots, two nights, nights of racing Friday and Saturday. And Revio.com and the 505 on Racing Show will be on hand with yours truly. And my daughter, Kerry, Riverhead Raceway track photographer, will also be on hand as she was commissioned by Earl Krause to come in and, and take some you know, pictures. And uh, it's a good opportunity for Kerry. And uh, I've been going to these indoor races in Atlantic City on and off since 1977 or 78 with my good friend Bill Stockett, former crew chief of my daughter and former race and party partner of mine back in the 70s. So it, it's a good show. It's two nights. Hun when I say hundreds of cars <laughs> show up for this and they weed them out through time trials, I hate to use that term, but you know, a tenth of a second means you're in the show or home. But uh, it's, a, it's a good venue. Also, in 2018, at the New Hampshire Motors, Motors, uh, yeah, Motor Speedway, the richest and longest race in the NASCAR Whalen Modified history will take place September 22nd. 250 laps of modified racing, 25,000 to win. Area Auto Racing News has confirmed an additional 25,000 or more may be at hand as well. The mods will, will have a part, will be a part, I'm sorry, of a triple header called Full Throttle Saturday. On hand will be the NASCAR Pinty Series out of Canada, as well as the NASCAR k and Pro Series East, with drivers from NASCAR's Mexico and European series. And I'll tell you what, they're offering a million, a million, a minimum of $100 for leading a lap. Think about that. Think about that. This is going to be a big race for the Modifieds, a race that um, the television has not been announced yet, but however, I'm willing to bet that there will be TV coverage for this race. 250 laps. They normally go 100. All those years under Bob Bear and the last couple of years with Bruton Smith's ownership. 100 laps. And, and I'll tell you what, that was, that was some event. That was some event. I was up in the tower race directing many of those events at New Hampshire. And also uh, towards the end of my NASCAR official career, on pit road as an inspector, and um, it, it's going to be a good show. I'm telling you what, 250 laps of modified action. Anyway, anyway, that's about it for tonight. I mean, I, I know we talked about a lot of stuff, but I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your busy schedules to be a part of our show tonight, to watch, listen, chat in the chat room, nice chat, folks always appreciate reading some of the comments that are made and they all make a lot of sense and my regulars 22 figure eight jay slice you know who almost never miss a miss a show just like my old friend wj who was always on and even when wj wasn't listed there was some some like top secret name that'd be under but we had some some fun winnie i think winnie logs in at like six o'clock to get a good seat i want to thank her for coming on but but anyway, wherever your endeavors bring them. And, and those are my friends going to Atlantic City for the Gambler's Classic, especially uh, my daughter's boyfriend, Vinny Delaney, who uh, is hoping to have a better fairing, pairing than he did at, the, at Allentown. But I want to wish all the competitors luck. It's going to be a little funny not having TC there because he put on a good show there. Rest in peace, big good buddy. But it's, it's an awesome show. 
and then to, to be there with my daughter while she's taking pictures, um, it, it, it kind of makes me like a proud papa. And uh, she wasn't a good driver, neither was I. But you know what? She, she can work a camera. And, and when the Earl Kraus, who puts this venue together, says, I've seen her work and she knows what she's doing, that, uh, that made me proud. So uh, we'll have some fun in Atlantic City this coming weekend. Again, everybody be safe. And wherever your endeavors are going to bring you this week, also be safe. Give somebody a hug. Tell them you love them. God bless you all. And we'll be back next week with news from Atlantic City. Have a good week, everybody. Good night. Eat,